It is now time to introduce our special guest. We're excited to have with us tonight, Linda Carney, MD. Linda Carney, MD, is a physician who is double board certified by the American Board of Emergency Medicine, as well as the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine, and practices lifestyle medicine in her private family practice near Austin, Texas. She documented corporate cost-saving health improvements for Whole Foods market employees while serving as the first medical director for Rep Esselstyn's Engine 2 Immersions. As a co-founder of www.atxalive.com, she promotes oil-free vegan restaurant events and free health presentations at Plant Pure Communities Potlucks. She blogs regularly on www.drcarney.com, offering photographs of her patient success stories where viewers find more than 1,000 scientific abstracts of studies supporting the plant-based lifestyle. Dr. Carney's life-changing seminars, videos, and food coaching phone consults are offered through www.vegivore.com. Dr. Carney's presentation tonight is entitled Food, Mood, and Women's and Men's Health. What's the connection? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Linda Carney. We're going to talk about fitness, fiber, and hormones. What's the connection? And more fiber, more fit. Yes, we think of fitness as, you know, running and lifting weights, but what is the underpinning of our athletic success? It's our food. And so, uh, Fiber is found only in plant foods, and you know the direction that I'm coming from. I'm going to be talking about the benefits of a plant-based diet for your fitness and your fiber and to keep your hormones balanced so that men won't get low testosterone and that women won't have all the problems that come from an imbalance of hormones. And so the more fiber, the more... Uh, testosterone you're going to have because fiber is a sponge that soaks up estrogen and it prevents excess estrogen because excess estrogen suppresses testosterone in both men and women. So we're going to talk about our objectives. Today we're going to cover eight in, in the next hour. We're going to cover eight lifestyle factors to reduce your risk for cancer diabetes type 2, obesity, anxiety and depression, and a man's risk for low testosterone and a woman's risk for many different health problems, including especially dysfunctional uterine bleeding. It's a one of the major goals of my life is to prevent unnecessary hysterectomies and to help young women who suffer from premenstrual syndrome and premenstrual dysphoric disorder because there is hope through plant-based diets. Let's talk about fiber. As you know, fiber is found only in plants, especially the unprocessed ones, and there's two kinds. There's soluble fiber, which swells up in water when you cook it, and fiber is sticky. It hangs on to glucose molecules, releasing them one at a time so that you get a nice rise in your blood glucose levels instead of a spike in your blood glucose levels because that spike can be inflammatory, and it can cause cancer and arthritis, and, uh, and fiber stays stabilizes that and fiber also lowers cholesterol, the soluble fiber found in oats and brown rice. But then there's insoluble fiber. It doesn't swell up when you put it in water. Picture a stalk of celery. It's in a glass of water. It's been there for eight hours. It's the same size as it was when you first put it in there. It's not swelling up. But fiber that's insoluble prevents constipation. Why is that important? To prevent varicose veins. And fiber that's insoluble makes you feel full. Fiber plus water makes bulk in the stomach and that gives you satiety so you feel full and satisfied but it adds no calories which makes fiber the weight loss wonder it's a filler it provides satiety which makes it like a medicine against obesity but it's also a medicine against diabetes and high cholesterol and it's an estrogen sponge so fiber came into our consciousness especially with dr dennis burkett he uh, studied colon cancer rates in Africa. He was a British missionary surgeon, and he's famous for developing the etiology, which that means the cause of a pediatric cancer
cancer called Burkitt's lymphoma, now called Burkitt's lymphoma. And he studied colorectal cancer rates in Africa, and he found that the more fiber, the less disease. And the less fiber, the more disease, the more um, colon cancer. And I want to add to what Dr. Burkitt has said. The less fiber in the diet, the worse your estrogen imbalance. The less fiber in the diet, the more estrogen and the less testosterone a man is going to have. So let's talk about why that is. And there are studies that back this up, published way back in 1994, the effect of dietary fat and fiber on serum estrogen concentrations. So fiber is a sponge. Now, 24-7, the liver is taking things, impurities, out of the blood that it doesn't want there. And one of those things is excess estrogen. And the liver is like a washing machine, and so it's taking that fiber out, sending it down a little tube called the bile duct, dumping it into the small intestines, where it's hoping for a sponge called fiber to soak up that excess estrogen. I'm talking about bioidentical estrogen, and it is uh, trying to get it out into the solid waste. That's what the fiber does. It carries that estrogen out in the solid waste. And so fiber is like a paper towel called Bounty, the quicker picker-upper. The more fiber in the diet, the more estrogen excreted in the stool. And in 1972, a study was published showing that there is, yes, higher estrogen content in the stool of people who eat whole food, plant-based, no oil diets, not in their bloodstream. We don't want that excess estrogen in the bloodstream where it can circulate around um, and cause cancer because fiber is a, gro I'm sorry, estrogen is a growth promoter. And aren't you glad that it's not your job to measure the levels of estrogen in stool. I'm glad that's not my job. And Dr. King analyzed dietary trends in uh, fiber intake from 1999 to 2008. And he found that to eliminate excess estrogen, you need to eat enough unprocessed plants. And a Western diet, which is very low in unprocessed plants, is unlikely to bind fiber estrogen to fiber. And that's going to permit the reabsorption of that estrogen back into the bloodstream. Because those intestinal villi, they line the lining of the intestine. And if there isn't enough fiber in the diet to soak up that estrogen like a sponge, that estrogen is going to come back into the circulation. And it's going to circulate around and do some damaging things, which we're going to talk about in this hour. And that Circulation has a special scientific name. It's called enterohepatic circulation. Entero means intestines. Hepatic means liver. Okay, so this uh, take-home message is excess estrogen, when, it's, when estrogen is overproduced, estrogen can promote growth of cells out of control. And I'm talking about our own bioidentical estrogen, the endogenous estrogen. Endo means inside. The kind of estrogen that we make within ourselves, but not just women. Men also can make this estrogen inside themselves, and it can promote tumor growth in men, not just in women. And excess estrogen fosters growth out of control, according to this study published by Russo in 2006. Let's talk about Dr. Rose's study, which studied um, estrogen imbalance and breast cancer, and this was published in 1991. If we increase dietary fat, we're going to raise estrogen and raise the cancer risk. So we've talked about the importance of fiber to keep that estrogen in balance, but if we eat too much fat in our diet, even on a plant-based diet, it can be harmful to us. A high-fat diet increased the risk for breast cancer in the Harvard Nurses Health Study too, 18% among all women. And if they were postmenopausal, it was 21%. And excess estrogen is a factor in premenstrual syndrome and premenstrual dysphoric disorder. It's a factor in depression and anxiety. And this is a quality of life issue for men and women. Did you know that studies show that women who are imprisoned for murder, they committed murder, are much more likely to have committed that crime in the three days prior to their period starting. And so this matters what we eat and what those estrogen levels are. Look at these beautiful vegan twins. These are Nina and Randa Nelson, who've written a wonderful book called The Clear Skin Diet. And they found that it was great to be vegan. I mean, they've been vegan for a long time, but because they 
realized the importance of a low-fat, whole food, unprocessed vegan diet that's oil-free, they were able to come back to the beautiful skin that they now have. And they're helping a lot of other young people achieve that also. And so excess estrogen is going to lead many women to dysfunctional uterine bleeding. The less fiber, the heavier the vaginal bleeding. Excess estrogen is also correlated with diabetes type 2, and a high-fat diet leads to diabetes type 2, whereas many people think that eating sugar causes diabetes type 2, but no, it's eating fat. Yes, eating animal protein will do it too, but oil blocks the muscle cell's door to insulin. Insulin then becomes... Uh, unable to unlock muscle's door, and this leads to insulin resistance and higher blood sugars. So back in the 1950s, Ansel Keys began his famous seven-country study, and what he was studying was uh, saturated fat and heart disease, but he also found that for every additional 10 grams per day of fiber, there was a 17% lower risk of fatal coronary heart disease, and this was followed over 40 years. And then along came Ken Carroll. Dr. Carroll in the 1970s from the University of Western Ontario studied the data from Ansel Keys, and he correlated animal fat and breast cancer. And he presented it in 1985 for the American Cancer Society. And this is my rendition in a simplified form of what you can see that there are many countries with high fat diets and they have much more breast cancer and countries with low fat diets and much less breast cancer. Basically, uh, Ken Carroll found that if you can get dietary fat less than about 10% of overall calories, you nearly eliminate the risk of cancer. And this is one of the things that I have against oil, vegan though it is. And then along came Dr. T. Colin Campbell, and he studied that the more animal protein, the more cancer. And so he also uh, took the data, and you see a very similar graph to the previous picture, the more animal protein, the more cancer. But if you can get animal protein less than 5% of calories, you can nearly eliminate cancer. So why should we care about whether our estrogen is excessive or imbalanced? The more estrogen, the more cancer, blood clots, hypertension. That affects both genders, as well as the ones specific to women, uterine fibroids, heavy vaginal bleeding, cysts of the ovary and breast. So how is estrogen like fire? Estrogen's like a two-edged sword. It's got a good edge and a bad edge. A little fire is a good thing in the right place. But too much fire can be disastrous. And so that's how we think of estrogen as a two-edged sword, with both a good and bad edge, because it's a powerful promoter of tissue growth. And that's why it's a key component of mother's milk. Because growth is good for a baby, but overgrowth is not good for a cell destined to become a fibroid tumor or a cyst of the breast or ovary. An overgrowth is definitely not good for a cell lining the inner uterus, that's called the endometrium, and it thickens the endometrium into heavy bleeding or cancer. And it could lead to a condition called menometrorrhagia, which is bleeding at the wrong time, you know, too frequently, bleeding the wrong volume, way too much, and iron deficiency anemia. So estrogen, you can think of it like fertilizer. It promotes cell growth, and you can think of estrogen like lawn fertilizer, making cells grow. But too much estrogen promotes too much growth, and overgrowth out of control, what do we call that in cells? We call it cancer. And progesterone is like lawn mower, and estrogen promotes cell growth, too much um, estrogen promotes overgrowth. Overgrowth of cells out of control is cancer. And we want our heavy vaginal bleeding or cancer risks to be low because we don't want to suppress our progesterone. When the endometrial thickens, which is more common as a woman ages after age 35, estrogen levels are too high. Progesterone levels then become too low because the estrogen level is so high. So what is it that lowers the progesterone level relative to the estrogen? It's not just ovaries that can make estrogen. This is why men make estrogen too, because body fat cells can produce estrogen, and they can even make higher estrogen levels than are good for the male health. When the body fat cells produce high estrogen, a signal is sent out, hey, in the body there's too much estrogen. So that signal goes to the ovaries and says, suppress production of hormones. The ovary produces both estrogen 
and progesterone, but progesterone is only produced in the ovaries. That's why men don't have any. And ovaries then suppress production of both of them, leading to a relative deficiency of progesterone. So here we are, a picture of the uterus, and that thickened inside lining, the endometrium, has been thickened by the lawn fertilizer, estrogen, and then progesterone is like lawn mower to regulate the flow out, and if we don't have the right balance, the progesterone is too low, and the bleeding continues, continues, continues until we get anemia, which is a deficiency of the red blood cells. And it's not that um, hysterectomy is the end of the world, but some women need a hysterectomy because they're bleeding so excessively. M many people think, well, I'm not going to change my diet. I'm not going to give up, you know, meat, dairy, eggs, oil. I'm not going to give up all of that because I like the way those things taste. And yet I've seen women bleed so suddenly, so severely, they find themselves in the emergency department. They're getting admitted to the hospital for blood transfusion after blood tr transfusion every day for four days until finally the surgeon says, I'm sorry, we've got to take this uterus out. Um, we can't keep giving you blood transfusion after blood transfusion. Or I've seen people bleed down to such severe anemia so suddenly that they have a heart attack. And when we have a hysterectomy, uh, it's not the end of the world, as I said, but intimacy is less pleasurable. Tissues are narrow, drier, more fragile, less able to accommodate. This is hard on a relationship. The lack of uterine secretions flowing through the birth canal mean more, may mean more infections. And of course, hysterectomy is painful. It's expensive. There's time lost from work. So take a look at the molecular structure of how similar these uh, sterile uh, compounds are. They all have a chain of carbon rings, and that's what makes them sterile compounds. See how similar the estrogen is to the testosterone? And that's how easily it can suppress the testosterone. When we take in dietary cholesterol, for which our bodies have no need, we don't need meat, dairy, and eggs, which are the only sources of cholesterol, but when we take it in, we can make excess estrogen and suppress testosterone in a man or suppress estrogen in a woman. So the logical question would be, okay, doctor, do I need a blood test of my estrogen level? And I am grateful to Dr. Ruth Heydrich for uh, what she has put out there on YouTube, and you can you know, hear her wisdom, and, and I learned these things from her. The measured level of estrogen may fall within the bell-shaped curve of normal, because the bell-shaped curve reflects where we are as a population, not necessarily where we should be. And estrogen at the cellular level that's what matters. So what I learned from Dr. Ruth Heydrich is that estrogen is protein bound. It's not even accessible to the reagents that are testing the level of estrogen. And it's also lipophilic. Lipo means fat and philic means loving. So it's fat loving, which means it's stuck to the cell wall. It's not even in that watery part of the blood, which is the part we're drawing out into a syringe for testing. And so it's uh, very hard to get an abnormal level in this country of estrogen because the range can be so broad because almost everybody's over estrogenized because of what they eat and drink. And we're gonna study those eight factors in our lifestyle that can make estrogen excess. And why it matters is because cancer is on the rise. Cancer is among the leading causes of death in females in the United States as of 2015. Number one killer of people in this country is heart disease. But cancer is quickly catching up to heart disease as a leading cause of death. And it's already become the number one cause of death for some racial groups. In fact, um, cancer is already... Uh, the number one cause of death for patients of the Kaiser Permanente system in eight Western states. So this study was published in 2012 in the journal Cancer Epidemiology. And epidemiology means the study of the causes. So this study showed that there was lower rates of breast cancer among vegan women in the Adventist Health Study too. But the Four Corners breast cancer study show that the more animal protein, the more estrogen, and the more breast cancer. And for those who think, well, hey, I'm just going to eat fish, I don't eat red meat, I'm going to be okay, 
Um, Dr. Wu studied Asians and dietary patterns and breast cancer risk, and the more fish that the Asians ate, the more their cancer, despite one of the blue zones where people live a long time and are very healthy, one of the blue zones is in Okinawa, Japan. You know, there are um, the three major blue zones, uh, Okinawa and Sardinia and Loma Linda, California, but only one of those is not shrinking in population of centenarians, which is people who reach age 100, and that's Loma Linda, because everywhere else the diet is rapidly getting too westernized. Dr. Dong studied... Um, many different studies in what's called a meta-analysis. He published it in 2011, and he found that the more fiber, the less estrogen imbalance, and the less breast cancer. So it goes both ways. You've got studies showing um, you know, too much animal protein, too much breast cancer. And you've got studies showing, hey, more fiber, less breast cancer. And this is important because cohort studies that are prospective, that's pretty good science. So let's talk about omega-3 estrogen, cancer, and diabetes. I know this slide is very busy. You may want to take a picture of it. Dr. Hooper published in 2006 um, a meta-analysis of 89 studies that, it, that were either cohort studies or randomized clinical trials, and there were over 600,000 subjects. So this was a big, big meta-analysis. Meta Omega-3 fats were not seen to prolong life, um, to, to decrease uh, cardiovascular events like heart attacks or cancer. And they couldn't even exclude clinically important harm, and you can translate that cancer. And vegans are not getting dementia due to a deficiency of omega-3. But vegans, some vegans are getting dementia because oils promote the vascular changes that clog brain arteries. If you eat leafy green vegetables at two different meals a day, you're going to get all the omega-3 that you need, and you don't need supplements. But Dr. Kausik published in 2009, and he studied long-chain omega-3 fatty acids, fish, and diabetes type 2. And over 9,000 cases showed a dose-dependent relationship that the more fish, the higher the risk for diabetes type 2. So... Supplements, stroke, and cancer. There's an $11 billion supplement industry, and they want you to believe that you need omega-3 supplements. But Cochrane Reports, which is very highly respected, published in 2008 a meta-analysis of 67 trials about supplements. And who would have thought that good things like vitamins, things that are found in plants, who would have thought that taking them in pill form could increase your risk of hemorrhagic stroke, vitamin E, 74% increased risk of hemorrhagic stroke if you're taking vitamin E pills, and an 18% uh, increased risk of liver cancer. And of course, vitamin A also. Um, if you are taking the food form of beta carotene, which is the precursor of vitamin A, you've got a decreased risk for cancer by 19%. But if you're taking the supplement form, vitamin A increased the risk for lung cancer by 18%. And all cause mortality, that means dying of any cause, by 8%. And which cancer is the cancer that more Americans die of every year? It's lung cancer, the leading, um, the, the deadliest of all the cancers. Let's talk about caffeine. This doesn't win me any popularity contest, but let's talk about caffeine, estrogen imbalance, and breast cancer. In this study by Dr. Ken Ishitani, caffeine consumption was correlated with the risk, with the increased risk of breast cancer. And this was a large prospective study. Again, prospective, that's the kind of data that we really uh, rely on. And it related... Um, uh, breast cancer to uh, caffeine because he studied benign breast disease, that's the BBD, benign breast disease, and there was a um, dose-dependent relationship that the more uh, caffeine, uh, the greater the risk of associated breast cancer for caffeine and coffee, and this was also for estrogen receptor negative breast cancers and progesterone receptor negative cancers, and for larger breast tumors, which are thought to be more deadly. So now we're going to get a little heavier into the biochemistry of how caffeine does, does its deadly work for heart disease and cancer. 
Caffeine is an antagonist of the adenosine receptor. And um, Dr. Wolfram says, antagonism of the adenosine receptor is the most plausible mechanism by which caffeine acts, especially with regard to the growth of carcinomatous human breast tissue. In 1990, uh, it was uh, shown that adenosine, which is a potent vasodilator, uh, is... Uh, counteracted by um, the presence of caffeine. And why does this matter for cancer? You know that cancer likes the low flow state. To initiate cancer, it likes a low flow state. And so a potent vasodilator that is being acted against, so you don't have vasodilation, you've got um, vasoconstriction, that's going to be a low flow state, and that is going to uh, make cancer initiation much more likely. Adenosine is a potent vasodilator, and this study in 2006 in the Journal of the American Medical Association showed that caffeine increased the risk for heart attack. Now, I know just last week it was published, hey, you can uh, drink all this uh, coffee that you want. It doesn't harm you. But everybody likes to hear uh, good news about bad habits. Adenosine and caffeine share the same cytochrome P450 enzyme system in the liver for metabolism. And it was found that if you were homozygous, that means you've got both alleles working for you. That means you're a rapid caffeine metabolizer. Well, good for you. You're able to handle all that caffeine. But intake of coffee was associated with an increased risk of myocardial infarction, that's a heart attack, only for individuals with slow caffeine metabolism, according to this study. Well, how do you know if you're a rapid metabolizer of caffeine or a slow metabolizer of caffeine? Well, 90% of us are slow metabolizers of caffeine. And in summary, consistent with most case control studies, we found that coffee intake is associated with an increased risk of non-fatal MI. It was 2012 when a really good, rigorous study done at the National Institutes of Health by Karen Schleip was published, and this was the biocycle study, and it equated caffeinated beverage intake and reproductive hormones. You can translate that estrogen. So caffeine causes excess estrogen, and it shares the same cytochrome P450 as adenosine and estrogen. And if the liver is distracted by metabolizing caffeine, you know that the liver has to metabolize caffeine because caffeine, if, it's, if you overdose on it, you can actually uh, die from a caffeine overdose. You know about the dogs that get into the chocolate and, and, and it's those methylxanthine, theobromine, and, and caffeine that are thought to cause the problem in the dogs. Um, if the liver is distracted by taking out the caffeine, it cannot remove the estrogen. So the estrogen is going to rise to a higher level. And the adenosine, caffeine, and estrogen sharing that same system, this was studied in basically one cup per day of caffeinated soda or green tea was associated with a higher estrogen level in the races that she studied, which was Asians, whites, and blacks. Increased estrogen also worsens PMS, cramping, acne, fibrocystic breast disease, and emotional disturbances. Caffeine intake has been associated with an increased risk of osteoporosis, breast cancer, endometriosis, fibrocystic breast disease, and has been hypothesized to exert its effects through alteration of endogenous hormone levels. Okay, I know the way scientists talk, it's, it's a little stilted there, but anyway, endogenous hormone levels, they're talking excess estrogen. This is the Rancho Bernardo study from 1996. In a GYN clinic over uh, six months, 69% of women reported breast pain each month. This is called cyclical mastalgia, and it uh, involves swelling, lumpiness, heaviness, tenderness, and pain. However, those symptoms can be avoided by oil-free vegans, and the breast health practices that I recommend are reducing your dietary fat, increasing your fiber. If you reduce dietary fat to less than 15% of calories, according to this study published in 2016, and you increase your complex carbohydrates, the women had less pain and breast swelling after six months. So plan ahead. Bring oil-free vegan food with you wherever you go. Yep. Every graduation party, yep, every wedding reception. Bring food with you so that you won't be tempted to say, well, there is nothing else that I could eat. Because if you're fighting um, symptoms that are disabling your quality of life, you deserve to be able to eat the food that's going to preserve your health. 
When we intake fiber, it prevents premenstrual dysphoric symptoms. So the question was uh, asked, was it the increased fiber responsible for the reduced pain? And this study by Dr. Baga showed that fiber was known to sweep the excess estrogen out of our system, preventing it from circulating in the bloodstream. But this study by Dr. Rose isolated the effect of dietary fat. We know that fiber is good for us, but the authors of this study noted that the drop in serum estrogen was not attributable to the increased fiber intake, but rather to reduced fat consumption. Now, we're going to list them for you. What are those eight lifestyle factors? We've been talking about them. What are those eight factors that make our estrogen too high? Dairy. Dairy is the biggest one that provides us with too much estrogen because there are more than seven estrogen precursors, that's building blocks, in cow's milk. When the cow is not pregnant, she's got about 17 units of estrogen. But when she's pregnant, it rises to over 1,000 units. And most of the cows in this country are milked when they're pregnant. Cows do not give milk because they're cows. Cows give milk because they are mothers. And that's even before they inject the cow with RBST to increase um, milk production and increase the um, estrogen in the milk. So... The largest source of estrogens is dietary. This study was published in the Iran Journal of Public Health in 2015, and it says that if you're not eating a vegan diet, it's unavoidable to get um, estrogens in your food. And in the Western diet, 60 to 70% of animal-derived estrogens come from dairy products. And those growth promoters, that estrogen in the cow's milk, is great for growing something really fast, growing a 60-pound baby calf into a 600-pound yearling cow in just one year. But cow's milk contains estrogens and proteins that, while they're good for the baby cow, are not good for human health. But you've been told by the milk industry that milk does a body good and that you'll prevent osteoporosis if you drink more milk. But that's not true. What causes osteoporosis, uh, there are many factors, but I'm going to talk about these five that are responsible for forcing the calcium out through the urine. Tobacco will do it. And then there are these next three are forcing excess water out into the urine because they're acting like diuretics, and that's alcohol and caffeine act like diuretics. And when salt has to be excreted so that it won't get too excessive in the body, water follows. But it's the animal protein that we really want to focus in on because the... All proteins are made of amino acids, but the animal proteins are more likely to have the sulfur atom in them. And this creates a lot of sulfuric acid that needs to be washed out by the kidneys because that's the kidney's job is to take acid out. And that acid is buffered by the calcium. So the calcium is leached out of the teeth and bones, weakening them. If we have weight-bearing exercise daily and vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin, we're going to counteract the effects of these other things if we can eliminate those five factors and put these two factors in. We need daily sunshine. It's not the sunshine that causes skin cancer. It's sunburns in the presence of a diet that contains animal protein. So here they are. You might want to take a, a picture of these eight factors that promote excess estrogen. We've talked about most of them. We've talked about eating too much fat in the oil and, and dairy. But um, I want you to take notice of wearing too much fat on our body. That can create excess estrogen in a man because every fat cell in our body is like a factory for estrogen, and that's where the men are getting their excess estrogen. Eating cholesterol, which is only found in meat, dairy, and eggs, raises estrogen levels, and now you know why because you've seen the molecular structure, how similar cholesterol and estrogen how similar they look. You know about the lack of fiber, but did you know that what they're feeding the animals that are being consumed for uh, meat and the animals that are producing the eggs and the milk, they're feeding them hormones and antibiotics. In fact, it's been estimated that more than 70% of the antibiotics produced in this country every year go into the feed of healthy animals, many of them labeled organic. And most of those antibiotics are coming out in the urine and in the manure of the animals unchanged. Drinking caffeine raises estrogen levels, and we haven't talked much about alcohol, but now you can understand why. Because you heard the story of how the liver is taking the excess estrogen out, and if something distracts the liver, and of course alcohol is a big distractor because the body knows that if you don't immediately put all the liver's resources into metabolizing the alcohol, you're going to go unconscious, and the body doesn't want that to happen. So when the 
uh, liver is distracted by metabolizing the alcohol, the estrogen is just going to flow right on by and not get taken out of the circulation, leading to the higher excess estrogen levels. Wearing too much fat raises our estrogen, according to this study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 1990. And just a reminder, um, when we eat cholesterol, we raise estrogen levels and suppress testosterone production. So I think if men realize that every egg that they're eating and every bit of cheese that they're eating is suppressing their testosterone, they might think twice about it. High cholesterol levels suppress a man's testosterone levels and suppress a woman's testosterone levels too, leading to no libido. High cholesterol in the serum can be, you know, related to our genetics, but the more oil that you eat, even if it's olive oil, the healthiest of, of all the oils, even if you don't heat the olive oil, that can still raise your cholesterol levels. And eating too much fat raises our estrogen, according to this study published in the year 2000 in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And how much fat is too much fat? When fat represents more than 20% of our calories, we may create excessive estrogen, which promotes cancer. And for those of you who don't know what Race for Life is about, that wonderful book by Dr. Ruth Heydrich, uh, she had breast cancer, and she was only 42 years old, and it was spread all over her body. But she met Dr. John McDougall, and he talked to her about a plant-based diet. And now she eats a low-fat, oil-free diet of uh, plants only, no meat, no dairy, no eggs, no oil. And so what kinds of foods have more than 20% of their calories from fat? Soy is a high-fat food, 54% of the calories from fat. Avocados, about 75%. Olives. Hemp seeds, sunflower seeds, flax seeds, all the seeds are higher in fat. Nuts, very high in fat. Coconut, uh, more saturated fat than lard. And of course, the oils, which are 100% of the calories from fat. So let's talk about some real world applications. It was a delight and an honor to work with the employees of Whole Foods Market, who came through Rip Esselstyn's Engine 2 Immersion. And here is Rip himself. Um, he is a best-selling author. He's, he was made his living as a triathlete for 10 years for the University of Texas at Austin. He uh, was a vegan firefighter, and he's the son of Caldwell Esselstyn Jr. MD. If you haven't read Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, that is a book worth reading. Animal protein causes cancer. We learned that uh, from the fine work of Dr. T. Colin Campbell. And Dr. Esselstyn taught us about vasoconstriction, which also fosters uh, the growth of cancer. This is their movie that they were in. It's available on Netflix, and Dr. Ruth Heydrich is in this movie. And that's uh, her Race for Life book has also inspired the employees of Whole Foods Market. And when we fed the people uh, from Whole Foods Market a diet without meat, dairy, eggs, oil, alcohol, caffeine, what happened was blood pressures dropped. And my job was to take them off their medicine before the blood pressures dropped too low. Blood sugars normalized for many of them. And cholesterol and triglycerides dropped. Now, I wasn't adding any cholesterol medicine. And I... I told them, you know, don't, don't change your cholesterol medicine. If you came into the immersion on cholesterol medicine, you can keep taking it if you want to. But many of them they didn't want to take it, and they stopped anyway. And we drew the blood. My staff drew blood on Monday and Friday. And cholesterols would fall like 100 points in five days for some people. Triglycerides fell 188 points in five days for some people. And they, eat, they ate all they wanted. They loved the food. It was buffet style. And... Uh, they ate more and weighed less. They lost about a pound a day, and their moods improved, and their joint pains were going away, and the asthma was going away. And I know that you're here because you care about health and you care about other people. And the knowledge that you're learning tonight and through Vegetarian Society of Hawaii can help you to bring hope to your neighbors and friends to enjoy better quality of life. This is a chart that I made to let you know that not all plants have the same concentration of calories. At the very top, with only 100 calories per pound of green vegetables, we have, you know, leafy green vegetables. Not enough calories for you to live only on leafy green vegetables. And at the very bottom, we have oils, so concentrated in calories, 4,000 calories per pound of oil. If you draw a line and eat above the line, success can be yours too. And I'm proud of you for being willing to look into these things as Sam did. And look how handsome he looks. 
This is the calorie concentration all laid out for you. You can see that the more concentrated the calories, the less room the food takes up in the stomach, leaving you nearly empty. The olive oil has four th more than 4,000 calories per pound, but it's too small of a volume. It doesn't stretch out the stretch receptors. The peanut butter, a vegan food, but it'll leave you still hungry because this lady is going to go in search of more bulk to fill her up because bulk creates satiety or satisfaction for the meal. Maybe some of you are already vegan and you wouldn't make the mistake of eating grilled chicken, but you can make the same mistake with Gardein or the Impossible Burger, which may be okay for transition foods. If that's what you need to get you off the animal products, go for that. But uh, if you need to lose weight or reverse disease, it's going to be much better for you not to make that uh, choice, but rather this choice. This person cannot hold another bite, so they're not going to go in search of more volume of food, and yet they have as many calories in their stomach as the one way over on the other side with the oil. Vegan is good. Vegan is not enough. You want to eat starch smart to feel satisfied without going hungry. You want to eat more and weigh less. And here's um, the proprietary chart that we created. All the foods here are vegan, but you can see you can draw a line. And if you're eating about 600 um, calories per pound of food, you're going to uh, have um, success in your weight loss. You can help people to find more joy, longer life. This dear lady uh, made her living impersonating Liza Minnelli, and you can hardly recognize her here. Look at Barbara's change, that a diet without meat, dairy, eggs, and oil, a diet of whole unprocessed plant foods did that. You've heard me talk about oil, and many vegans don't talk about oil, but because I'm in the business of um, reversing disease, I know that there are people who are not going to get to their goal unless they get the oil out. Oil has no fiber. It's just too dense in calories. It's just fat, no protein or carbohydrates. So it's easily stored as adipose from the lips to the hips. That's where the oil goes. It promotes acid reflux. It hurts the endothelial cell. So the endo means inside. And this is a normal human artery right here, my hand. And the endothelial cell that lines the inside of the artery makes a gas called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide dilates the artery wide open. And we want that vasodilation because when you've got the vasodilation, your knee meniscus is not wearing out as fast and your back discs aren't slipping. But if you eat or drink or smoke something that hurts the endothelial cell, within 20 minutes, it can't make the nitric oxide. And then flow-mediated dilation is restricted and you've got vasoconstriction. And that low flow causes the hearing loss and the insomnia, and the diabetes, and the foot pain, and the arthritis, and all the host of other problems. Oil promotes cancer by raising estrogens. Oil is inflammatory, um, creating uh, the risk for arthritis. It's atherogenic, and that's atherosclerosis plugs up the arteries. That's the number one killer of Americans. One out of every two of us dies from atherosclerotic complications. This means that when you eat oil, yes, you are going to raise your uh, cholesterol levels. And um, not everybody's going to raise their cholesterol levels. It really depends on your genetics. And you may say, but there are studies showing that olive oil doesn't raise it. Well, who paid for those studies? And it's a substitutionary trick. If you substitute olive oil for lard... Oh, yeah, you know, your, your cholesterol is going to look better. But when you compare broccoli with olive oil... Not a chance. In fact, the protein that lowers um, cholesterol the most is lentils. Of all the plant proteins, wheat lowers cholesterol levels the least. And then again, oil is addicting. It hits the pleasure center and makes a lot of uh, feel-good chemicals come out. The higher in concentration uh, the calories are in a food, the better we like it. The more it hits the pleasure center, the more endorphins, you know, the feel-good chemicals we get. But... There is hope for um, anxiety and depression, despite the fact that antidepressant pills have been found by some studies not to work any better than placebo. There's hope for people who are willing to use food as plant food, as medicine, get to bed before 10 p.m., and exercise daily.
Dr. Neil Nedley boiled down all the risk factors for depression into 10 hit categories, and two of them we can't do anything about. We can't do anything about the way we inherited genes for depression or anxiety, and we can't do anything about the way we were raised, the developmental hit. Uh, were both parents present? Some people need to work uh, night shifts because that's the job that, that they have, and so that is a risk factor for uh, depression. But the other risk factors we can do something about, and if we do something about exercise and fresh air and sunlight, and we have good plant-based nutrition, uh, and we limit our intakes of uh, high fat, sugar, and cholesterol, we're gonna be able to reverse that risk factor for depression. There are toxic reasons for depression, lead, mercury, arsenic, bismuth, a lot of these are coming in through the fish that people eat. There's the addictions that can also imbalance our neurotransmitters. There's medical diseases, that can increase your risk of depression. And of course, uh, going through a loss like a divorce, uh, bankruptcy, death of a spouse. But it's the frontal lobe, our self-talk, that is um, risk category number 10. And the frontal lobe is our analyzer, the seat of our judgment, the willpower, and the morality. And if we understand that the way we talk to ourselves and the way we think about reality can really make a difference to our moods, our anxiety, and our depression, if we undervalue the rewards or have a fear of success or uh, we have a very low frustration tolerance. All these things can torpedo our frontal lobe and make us more likely to be anxious or depressed. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a big part of Dr. Neil Nedley's program. He's got um, a institute in Northern California. It's in a town called Weimar, and he's got the New Start program. And cognitive behavioral therapy says that thoughts and beliefs create feelings, and out of feelings flow behavior. So if you want the very best behavior, you need your thoughts and beliefs to give you the best feelings. And using cognitive behavioral therapy, exercise therapy, classical music, plant-based diets, um, getting to bed early, Dr. Nedley has a 98% success rate after people do his program for one year, getting people off of antidepressants if they maintain the plant-based diet and, and those other lifestyle factors I mentioned. So let's look a little bit about the biochemistry of depression. The feel-good chemicals are serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. And there is, we want more of them because they make us feel better, but there's an enzyme called monoamine oxidase that breaks down our excess monoamines, our excess serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. How can we tamp down that enzyme, monoamine oxidase? How can we do that safely? There are some drugs that do it, but they have some dreadful side effects. But did you know that certain foods actually contain phytonutrients that appear to naturally inhibit monoamine oxidase? Serotonin is our feel-good chemical. How can we make more of it? How do we boost our levels? Tryptophan is an amino acid precursor of serotonin. But here's the problem. Foods contain a smaller amount of tryptophan compared to the amounts of other amino acids. So little tryptophan is outnumbered. He's got a smaller tribe. All the amino acids are knocking at the door of the brain. It's a gate called the blood-brain barrier. And they're all competing to get through the gate into the brain. How can little tryptophan get into the brain where it can make serotonin and make the brain feel happy? How can little tryptophan win the race against the other amino acids? Well, put it to the test, as Dr. Greger says, a high protein meal caused tryptophan levels in the brain to go down. High carbohydrate meals caused tryptophan levels in the brain to go up. High carbohydrate meals, and plants are full of carbohydrates, cause serotonin levels in the brain to go up, according to Dr. Wortman at MIT. So how does that work? How to get your share of serotonin? Eat meals rich in complex carbohydrates, and that will boost your insulin levels. Insulin's key opens the door to the muscles. Remember, there's a door with a lock in it so that the amino acids can get sucked up by the muscles for fuel. Well, if all those amino acids that are so plentiful, if they're all getting called to the muscle and they're getting sucked up for fuel, that leaves little tryptophan waiting patiently in line at the blood-brain barrier, and then little tryptophan becomes comes first to cross the blood-brain barrier. Carbohydrate-rich meals boost the brain levels of tryptophan, and that increases the levels of serotonin. It's your feel-good chemical. Animal protein meal, less happy. 
The real happy meal is a plant protein meal and carbohydrates that boost the levels of serotonin. Dr. Greger says greens beat the blues. So what else was in the diet that reduced depression? The more veggies, the less depression, according to this study. And eating a higher consumption of vegetables may cut the odds of developing depression by as much as 62%, according to a journal review in Nutritional Neuroscience. Do supplements work? You need that folate um, from, from foliage, but no. If you put folate into folic acid, then it's a supplement, and neither pills nor powders have been shown to prevent disease. It's not from folic acid in supplement form, according to this study of aging Latinos in the Sacramento area. Do foods affect moods? Dr. Beasel studied vegetarian diets and mood states, healthy mood states, in a cross-sectional study of Seventh-day Adventist adults. Not all Seventh-day Adventists are vegetarian, but a lot of them are, so they make a really good study group. And the vegetarians reported significantly less negative emotion than the omnivores. So how does that work? Arachidonic acid can cause brain inflammation. So what is arachidonic acid? It's an omega-6 fatty acid, and chicken and eggs contribute more than all other sources of um, arachidonic acid combined. Just eating one egg can significantly raise your levels of arachidonic acid, and omnivores consume nine times more arachidonic acid than those eating plant-based diets. So an interventional study, now this is the gold standard in nutritional research, an interventional study is where you gather the subjects, you change their diets, and you see what happens. So they took men and women who ate uh, meat, and they took away their eggs and their chicken and all their other meats, and within two weeks, their mood improved, according to this 2012 study. And the researcher concluded, perhaps eating less meat can help protect mood in omnivores especially those susceptible to depression. But this is the famous GEICO study. Dr. Neil Barnard, we have him to thank for this. You know GEICO, they sell insurance with the gecko in their ads. They had um, 10 workplace locations that they allowed um, Dr. Neil Barnard's team to come in and talk to the overweight diabetic employees, and they encouraged them to follow a whole food plant-based diet. And there was no portion control, no calorie counting, no carb tracking. They were specifically told not to change their exercise habits. They wanted to find out the uh, the effect of exercise, uh, the effect of diet without exercise. And they didn't provide them the food, but the cafeteria at Geico did start um, offering bean burritos and veggie ministry soup, and a control group of employees didn't receive any dietary advice. So what happened after five months of the study? The plant-based diets were best. It was a resounding success, and they had better moods and better body weight and blood sugar level, better f functioning. I'm just grateful to Dr. Um, Neil Barnard because he shows you how to prevent Alzheimer's, how to prevent strokes and memory loss. Whole foods uh, that are from plants can be the very best medicine for the brain. And this is a great cookbook too, by the way. Even overeating can be a risk factor for depression. There are results from my private practice of people who have switched to the kind of diet that I eat. I have chosen to eat without meat, dairy, eggs, oil, alcohol, caffeine. And I've seen people who have measured their uh, DEXA, that's a bone density study, from one year to the next, same machine, um, uh, an independent machine. I don't own the machine. And they've moved from the osteoporosis category to the osteopenic osteopenia category, which is insufficient um, bone density, but not as bad as osteoporosis. And there have been some who moved from osteopenia back to the normal um, bone density. So there's a lot of hope. And I've seen asthma uh, reverse in my patients. For myself, I was a vegan, but it wasn't until I gave up the oil that one month after giving up my beloved olive oil that I had eaten all my life, that my asthma went away for good. If I would like to be asthmatic again, ha ha, who would? If I would like to be asthmatic again, all I have to do is add the olive oil back in and I will be wheezing within 24 hours. Ask me how I know. And uh, in my private practice, diabetes is reversed. Multiple sclerosis is reversed. Um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder is reversed. People who've been tried for years to get pregnant have gotten pregnant as a result of eating a low-fat plant-based diet. I've seen human papillomavirus um, test results reverse very rapidly when people adopt oil-free vegan diets. I've seen thyroid nodules disappear uh, when ultrasounds are done a year apart. Uh, this is not something I learned in medical school. It's not something you're going to find in the textbooks. We can't promise that for everyone, but I've seen it happen for some of my patients. And 
uh, perhaps one of the happiest results is people getting off antidepressant pills if they really don't want to take them uh, and the resolution of their anxiety and depressive disorders. So if we eat plants, we'll get to the heart of the matter and we'll be able to reverse a lot of diseases. So the last thing we're going to talk about before we close is diabetes. Intra myocellular lipid. It's a big word, and intra means inside, myo means the muscle. When you've got fat in the diet, it gets into the muscle cell and blocks muscle's door. And the glucose can't get into the muscle cell because insulin can't unlock the door. And so glucose stays in the artery, in the vein, and it turns the artery wall sticky, like cotton candy or honey. And then the pancreas burns out because the pancreas is tasting the blood flowing by saying, oh, too much sugar in that blood. I better make more and more and more insulin. So it burns out overproducing insulin. But... People who give up meat, oil, dairy, eggs, refined foods, very concentrated in calories, like um, flour, which has way more calories than the plant that it came from, and narcotic foods that change the neurotransmitters, like alcohol and uh, caffeine, those things can, if you eliminate them, can make a type 2 diabetic to be able to get off their medicine and have normal blood sugars. In 2015, the sequel to Fork Shorver Knives came out. It was a plant pure nation, and they inspired uh, some of my patients in Texas to make ATX Alive, which is our name for our potluck community. And we have monthly potlucks where 50 to 80 people per month come. It's coming up this Sunday, and sometimes you can uh, see it um, on our ATX Alive website. And if you would like some help, um, there are telephone consults that you can avail yourself of. You can watch the free trailers for videos that I have at veggivore.com. And we're going to close with a little bit about caffeine and B12 loss. Everybody needs to take um, B12 over the age of 50, according to the World Health Organization, because we don't absorb it very well. And caffeine is a diuretic, and B12 is wa water soluble. But honestly, I have more B12 deficient patients among my non-vegan patients in my medical practice than among my vegans because the vegans know that they need to um, take B12. Caffeine can affect fertility, even men's fertility. If they're drinking caffeine in the two weeks before conception, a much greater risk for pregnancy loss in miscarriage. 344 couples in Texas and Michigan were included in this study as they tried to conceive. Drinking uh, caffeinated beverages raised the risk of early pregnancy loss by 74%. And that held whether the woman the women drank caffeine before they conceived or afterwards. And so this was the life study, another study published in uh, Fertility and Sterility, that women were more likely to miscarry in the first seven weeks of pregnancy if they drank two daily caffeinated beverages. And they're thinking that it's the excess estrogen that causes these uh, miscarriages. Caffeine in green tea. Is it okay? Well, green tea comes from the top two leaves and the bud of the tea plant, but that's where the most methylxanthines, which are the bitter alkaloids, caffeine, theoromine, are concentrated. Now, to turn green tea into black tea, you put it into a big vat, add bacteria, and you ferment it. And what happens is the bacteria eat everything nutritious out of those green leaves and leave behind a black, bitter substance that has a lot of caffeine in it. Well, why is there so much good hype about uh, green tea? Why are they so marketed with all, hey, it's good for you, so many antioxidants? Well, newsflash, plants have antioxidants. Plants are good for us. But marketing is the method of elevating one property of something and hiding the other properties that you don't want. This study showed that compared to non-tea drinkers, Green tea drinkers in this study were more likely to be premenopausal. Okay, so they're younger. They have higher income, more education, more likely to eat produce, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables. No wonder their health looked better. Let's talk a little bit about cacao, which is a vegan product that comes from plants. The cacao bean um, gives you a substance in into which we make chocolate, but coming straight out of the cacao bean, it's 55% of its calories from fat. That's a pretty high percentage, more than soy. And cacao is naturally bitter. You have to add a lot of sugar to get it to be palatable. And it's naturally gritty. You have to add a lot of fat, which is mostly saturated, because saturated fats are solid at body temperature. Then if you add milk chocolate, then it's even more addicting because it, you've got the quadruple whammy of addiction. You've got caffeine, theobromine, uh, the sugar, the fat, and then the casein.
Why are theobromine and caffeine in plants? They are a defense against overgrazing of the plant. The eland, the largest ungulate in Africa, grazes on the leaves of the acacia tree, and the leaves sense that they're being crushed or chewed, and they send out a pheromone, a wind-borne chemical, to raise the level of bitter alkaloids so that the next bite the eland takes is astringent. It's bitter, and that makes the eland not want to eat that tree anymore. And so it wanders down about 50 meters where the pheromone hasn't had a chance to get blown there by the wind. And those leaves have not gotten the signal. So they don't have high levels of the bitter alkaloid. So bitter alkaloids are in plants to prevent overgrazing, but they're not so good for human health. So what should our goals be? We should be plant-based with less than 20% of our calories from fat. We should eat whole foods that are unprocessed with minimal loss of water, no modification of the fibers, no added sugar, fat, or salt. It's not that I don't eat any salt, but most Americans are consuming way too much. And if we eat grains, and I do eat grains, we should have only whole grains. I'm grateful to uh, all of the people um, who have taught me so much, and I'm grateful to the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii for inviting me here. I've learned things from watching your wonderful videos on YouTube, and I hope to connect with you uh, through a telephone consult or just through drcarney.com. It's free. You can sign up for a free membership and look at the thousand studies, and success can be yours, and I'm proud of you for learning how a low-fat plant-based diet can help you get healthy by choice and not by chance. Thank you. Mahalo to all of you for coming. Uh, have a safe return home. Good night, everyone.